Thank you very much, Claire. Uh, I hope everybody can see the screen now and can hear me. I'm sure somebody will interrupt and tell me if that's, uh, if that's not the case. Um, so thank you very much for inviting me to participate in your uh, lecture series for The Light Stuff. Um, this is a little bit um, different to some of the previous talks because we're not using um, synchrotron source radiation for this, but it's a technique that can be applied in a very similar way to some of the diffraction scattering techniques that you've already seen. So uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit on um, using EBSD to explore the solar system. And um, to start with, I guess I need to tell you a little bit about what EBSD is. So um, electron backscatter diffraction is uh, a technique that we can use in an electron microscope. And it utilizes a, a type of detector, an EBSD detector, um, which you can see here. I'm just going to see if I can get the laser to working. Um, so this detector comes in perpendicular to the beam. So we have an electron beam being generated in the microscope, which is illustrated by this red line. And then you normally have a series of other detectors in here for imaging, different types of imaging techniques, whether they're atomic contrast images or X-ray element maps. And you'll see some of those as we go through. Um, the EBSD detector comes in. Um, so you actually have to angle your specimen this is the sample here, at about 70 degrees in order to get an optimum signal on your EBSD detector. And what that means is that the, the angle at which your beam is interacting with the different atoms within a structure changes, and we can actually detect that. So we're talking about a electron beam x-rays coming in and interacting with the structure. So electron backscatter diffraction can be used to look at a crystalline structure, so naturally occurring minerals, um, and the rocks that are made of minerals all contain these natural crystalline structures and they're very, very well defined structures that we know about and you can use this technique to be able to analyze them. So you have different lattice planes and you can see the beam interacting. Each of those um, is in a very defined position. Um, and what this looks like on the screen is these bands are detected. They're called Kikuchi bands and they're illustrated over here. This is a electron backscatter pattern or EBSP and you can see each of these bands correlates to a different um, lattice within your crystalline structure. So if we wanted to simplify that we would talk about the different um, uh, indices that we have in a crystalline structure. So for geologists we call these Miller indices but you can talk about lattice parameters and they're different axes within a solid material and they all intersect with each other. So there's just um, some examples of some common patterns here. This is the electron backscatter pattern down here, and this is the crystalline axis which it represents. So if you look at a cube and you rotate the cube, depending on which face you're looking at, you see a different pattern being replicated on the screen. So that's what the, um, the electron backscatter detector is looking for, is that those different Kikuchi bands on the phosphor screen in here. And what that can be um, uh, interpreted as is it's not just simply having that pattern you don't need to learn to read those patterns and try and remember all the different lattice parameters for your materials thankfully we've got some very clever software that can translate those electron backscatter patterns those Kikuchi bands into maps of your specimen so um, the Kikuchi bands on the left here can be translated into a pattern map which show you different crystals individual crystals within your structure and this is a this is a good example. So each color on here it represents a different orientation. So a different axes that we're looking at. So all the blues are a similar orientation to each other. All the purples are a similar orientation to each other. But the blue is a different orientation to the purple. And you can look at it on an individual crystal basis like that, or you can look at phases. So for example. This image on the right hand side is just a red and blue image where everything red is the same structure and everything blue is the same structure. And if we zoom in and have a look at a smaller area, you can actually start to see different crystal patterns um, between these two different phases, the red and the blue. So this is an example in a steel, which is a very simple structure between the two materials. So you have these phase maps. And then again, if we go back to the different crystallographic orientations, the crystals here, no matter what, you can see the orientations in one direction or in multiple directions indicated by the number of different colors you have present. So you no longer have to remember what all of those indices are. The maps show you how many different crystal faces you're looking at, which can be really quite useful. 
Um, there's plenty more tutorials and background on how this technique works um, on the following website. So I'm not going to go too much um, into the, the geometry of all of this, but what I do want to tell you is how we're utilizing it. Um, so electron backscatter diffraction has been around a while. Technology is improving um, every year, it seems. We get some new advances in the software and in the hardware as well allow us to um, sort of interrogate our samples and try and work out how things are formed or how they're deforming because as a material changes the crystalline structure the natural structure of that material can deform and that can be due to the sample being heated whether it's uh, an engine blade that's being heated or being cooled for example or whether it's a natural sample like a rock that's undergone um, some kind of movement due to earthquakes and frictional damage to change the structure of these materials so on the left hand side, we have a typical electron backscattered pattern, not a fantastic, you can see a very mottled effect here. Uh, and that's been deliberately chosen to show you that sometimes this data is not entirely confident. On the right hand side, you can see a black and white map. This is what we call a band contrast image. So what this is showing you is where you have really bright areas, that's where you have good data, the EBSP, the patterns are really confident. And where you have black areas, you can see that you don't get that contrast, the bands haven't been resolved and therefore you have poor data. So if you compare the band contrast image on the right to the uh, Euler map, the Euler colour map on the left, you can see those black areas correspond to what look like depressions in the sample, but otherwise the colours are showing you that we have lots of different orientations in this, um, in this sample in terms of different grains. So if we look at a particular area, um, I'm just zooming in, so the scale bar in case that's not clear is five micrometres or microns along here. You've got some grains where we have a very, very high degree of confidence in our analytical uh, certainty, and then others where we're seeing perhaps two different orientations, so it's not sure um, what's going on here. So this needs to be mapped again at higher resolution. But if we focus on these two grains, the one that's really confident and the one that's not so confident, I wanted to show you how, the, uh, how this affects the EBSD data. So if we pick a particular point, so there's a little orange cross, I hope, coming up on your screen showing you that we are now live on this grain. I'll put the laser pointer over that. On the left hand side, you can now see what would be the live electron backscatter diffraction pattern. And it has labeled each of those crystallographic axes for you. Um, and what's important here is as you move around a crystal, if it's the same orientation, you see a slight deviation. So I'm just moving up. You can see the pattern is changing. If we go in, into a diff crystal, a neighbor which the Euler map shows us is a different color entirely, so a different orientation, you can see that the EBSP changes. So we now have the 110 uh, axes here, and if I go back to the other crystal, it's the 001 axes that we're watching. So if I flick between these two, and hopefully even with the delay over the internet connection, you can see the changing between the two different crystals, those orientations become easier to distinguish. So we can be pretty confident that we do have some um, different crystallographic orientations within this sample. As the technology has improved, we've been able to utilize electron backscatter diffraction or EBSD to look at even finer grains. And that can be really useful where you have deformation within a sample. So for example, if we're looking at uh, welds, so welding some metals together, you're creating a point and that can create or changes material. So at the top of this image here, we have a point which has been welded and you can see the natural crystalline structure on the outer rim. So here on the left hand side and over here on the right hand side. But in the middle, below the point that's been welded, you can see some disordering and these grains start to elongate. They're stretching out and they're, they're being deformed. If we use the electron backscatter diffraction to go in and look at point potential weakness, so closer to so up here at the top, we can go into a higher magnification. We're now looking at a 40 micrometer um, scale bar down here. You can start to see that those fractures actually penetrate through the material, which weren't so obvious at the higher magnifications. And again, we can bring in and in and go further and further into the micro or even the nano scale. We're now using 
10 nanometer step size, you can start to see that we have these really, really tiny grains that were invisible at the larger scale underneath our weld. But coming down here, you can start to see where we've had fracturing, which is this black space where there are no grains present, and then recrystallization of larger grains into much, much smaller ones as a result of that fracturing. And that can tell us quite a lot about the material, how that material is gonna behave over a period of time or under conditions of high stress, whether that's temperatures or pressures. And that's where EBSD has traditionally been used. It gets used an awful lot in materials science. But as geologists, we're not used to talking about metals and engine blades and heating and cooling in the same capacity. We're talking about the processes that shape the earth as a whole system. And that's quite fundamentally different because we're now looking at a really, really large scale. The earth is huge. So perhaps looking at things on the nanometer scale aren't really that helpful when we want to talk about an entire planet. But EBSD has been used in the geological sciences. I mentioned briefly earlier that we use it a lot when we're talking about earthquakes. So where earthquakes happen, the earth is literally apart and it's causing um, stresses along the point of failure, those, those fault lines. And this is a, an example of a quartz sample. So quartz is a very common mineral um, that occurs uh, on the earth's surface. And we can see the deformation that's resulted from an earthquake happening and you can see these bands across the sample we've got areas of reds and pinks and blues where these crystals have been stretched and they've been pulled apart and realigned so they're all pointing in the same direction within these different bands and each of those bands has for orientation but you can very distinctly see them and these sort of sizes are on a much larger scale. We're still talking about the micro level. This is a 1.3 millimeter image, but it's significantly larger than that nanometer information because you're trying to infer something happening on a very, very large scale while still looking at it in a microscope. The problem is that EBSD on this scale used to be, take quite a long time. So this is a beautiful EBSD map that we collected over a weekend, but the time it took to collect this was over 63 hours, which is a really, really long time um, to generate such, uh, such data. So we were looking for other methods. Thankfully, um, electron back scatter diffraction has, in, has improved. We had some new generation detectors a couple of years ago, which allow us to look at uh, much larger areas much, much quicker. Um, so this is another earthquake sample we've been looking at. Again, we've got lots of quartz. So this is a phase map where all the red you can see on the screen is the quartz crystals within here. And the blue is actually gold mineralization within that quartz. And this is from a particular earthquake zone. And what was interesting here is we were able to analyze this area with a, a smaller step size, so better resolution than the previous map. And this one only took three hours rather than 63 hours. And the area is quite a lot larger as well. So the phase map showed us that we definitely have lots and lots of quartz in this sample, which we were expecting. And of course, we were able to see the gold, which is in blue. If we change that to the band contrast image, you can see where we're getting good signal against bad signal. So there's this porous area in the middle, which is illustrated by the black, um, where we don't get the signal. But these are the gold grains in here, in amongst the quartz around the outside. And if I change that to what we call an IPF map, which is an integrated pole figure map, um, this allows you to see the different orientations. So again, each color on here represents a different orientation of the grains. And you can see very clearly that even where all the quartz is uh, in the phase map, you can see there's a dominance of quartz. It's still not oriented all in the same direction. So we, we have uh, a very natural crystalline fabric here that hasn't necessarily been affected so dominantly by stresses as we saw in the previous one. And this is almost a 5 million pixel map, so there's a lot of data points on here which we're able to generate really quickly, which opens up the technique to be used in geological sciences quite a lot more. We can start looking at greater scales and start looking at uh, different systems more globally. But as geologists, we don't just study the Earth. That's one system, and it's a very important one. It's home for all of us, which is uh, obviously very important. But the Earth as a system is part of something much, much larger. So the solar system out there is full of loads of different planets, different asteroids, moons, and plenty of other bodies as well. And there's a lot of geology out there. It's not just all about the Earth. So we have to even increase our scales once again. Thankfully, we have explored quite greatly around the solar system. There are literally hundreds and hundreds of different space missions that have gone out to the furthest reaches of space as well to our planetary neighbors. And we've been able to study the different moons, planets, asteroids all around us. So 
Um, it's not just about the astronaut, astronauts walking on the surface of other um, other bodies. Unfortunately, that has only been true of the moon so far. But uh, geologists have walked on the moon. This is a geologist. Uh, Harrison Jack Smith, who was on the Apollo 17 mission. So um, geologists have walked on the surface of the moon and you can see he's a geologist because he's absolutely covered in uh, lots of dirt <laughs> from uh, from the samples he's been collecting. Um, but obviously they, they weren't able to do electron butts after diffraction in situ on the surface of the moon. And even with the planetary explorers we have today, like uh, the Curiosity rover, who's active on the surface of Mars as we speak, um, Curiosity is equipped with lots of different techniques, including some diffraction techniques, um, unfortunately not EBSD. So instead of relying on planetary exploration, we have to rely on looking at these things in situ within a scanning electron microscope here on Earth. But thankfully, we can still do that um, using extraterrestrial samples because they are naturally delivered to us in the form of meteorites. So I'm sure a lot of members of this audience will have seen a shooting star at some point in their life. We're actually in the middle of a meteor shower at the moment. So if you have clear skies tonight, do go out and have a look in the, in the Northern Hemisphere. You can see it really, really well from uh, around Europe. Um, but not all of them mean that something lands on the surface of the Earth. And that's what's really sad about being a planetary scientist is these shooting stars are really, really common. But it's the really, really bright events, the fireballs, like the ones seen here, that are important important because fireballs are where something survives atmospheric entry. It doesn't burn up and disappear. And that's when we might be lucky enough to find a meteorite like this. And the meteorite family tree is really quite diverse. We talk about them in terms of having stony meteorites, which are the green ones, or iron meteorites, which are the red ones on this family tree. And I'm not going to go into all the details of this. Instead, I'm going to group them for you and say that these are the most common meteorites that we have, these chondrite meteorites. And these chondrite meteorites come from um, asteroids, largely from the main belt in between Mars and Jupiter, but we also have some near-Earth asteroids and plenty of other ones. So the uh, image that's very slowly moving on your screen at the moment is a map of all of the asteroids that we've mapped in our solar system. So you can see the orbits of the planets around the sun and all those other green and brown dots are other asteroids that could potentially be the parent body of some of the meteorites that we're looking at. And when you look at a chondrite under a microscope, it's a type of meteorite, and it's very, very obvious because of these round circle structures. These are what's called chondrules, and about 90% of all of the meteorites we have on Earth are full of these chondrules. And electron backscatter diffraction, or EBSD, can be used to tell us about the history of these things. Is there any kind of preferred alignment within these chondrules? So on the right-hand side, you can see a single chondrule that's been mapped using EBSD. And you can see you have this preferred alignment of these grains within here. So that can tell you something about how these, how these chondrules formed. And they can be very, very old. Um, this chondrule here is from the Allende meteorite. So some of the um, objects within the Allende meteorite are leftovers from when all the planets were forming into the planets that we know today. Some of these objects didn't make it into planets and are still out there in the solar system as part of these asteroids and they're about 4.7 billion years old. So we have some really, really, really old um, objects recorded within that chondrite meteorite group. The iron meteorites are a different type of meteorites. These are the ones that you commonly see in disaster movies. If you've ever seen Armageddon, you think about them wanting to uh, drill down, but they couldn't because it was solid iron and nickel metal. This is the inspiration for asteroids like that. So this is what we call an iron meteorite, which has this natural crystalline structure. And I said all um, naturally occurring uh, rocks, minerals, they have a natural structure. So this is iron and nickel metal, this crisscross pattern called the wittmann saturn pattern. And the wittmann saturn pattern is perfect for testing EBSD. You can see here there's a couple of examples from the manufacturers of EBSD systems like to use iron meteorites because the wittmann saturn pattern gives you a really, really beautiful interlocking crystal structure where you can see long crystals aligned in one direction being intersected in multiple different crystallographic orientations. And that's really, really clear with iron meteorites. It's like a fingerprint. No two iron meteorites have exactly the same pattern. So these examples are both different types of iron meteorites and it's like a fingerprint. It only belongs to that, that parent. So you can tell them apart really easily. But for geologists, the most exciting potentially group of meteorites are the ones that most similarly um, resemble things that we see here on Earth and we're able to make direct comparisons. And they're a group of meteorites called the achondrites, which represent more typical Earth rocks 
disks. So, for example, this is a meteorite um, from Mars, which has a crystalline structure which doesn't look too different to some of the rocks that you might see if you've ever been to Iceland or Hawaii. And that's because it formed in a very similar way. We have these large crystals. This is a, a mineral known as olivine. Um, which is a very magnesium iron rich mineral and it's embedded within this finer grained matrix of other minerals um, of various different compositions and the similarity to earth is because we have the volcanoes on earth all over the place but we also have volcanoes throughout the solar system so whether it's venus mars or even the moons around saturn and jupiter with io and uh, europa and in fact mars is home to the largest volcano anywhere in the solar system and if you don't think that image is very impressive think about the last picture of a volcano you saw were you able to see the picture of the planet into the volcano itself it's quite a significant volcano um, olympus mons on mars is about three times just under three times the height of everest so it's really really quite a large volcano but it is erupting a very similar type of rock to what we see on some areas here on earth so we're going to dwell on that one we're going to look at mars so i'm um, looking at some examples and the one I gave you earlier was large crystals set within a finer grained matrix, but no two rocks on Mars are exactly the same. These are all subject, um, all subjects from Mars, but they all look quite different. And the textual variability is where EBSD can really help us because it can tell us a little bit how, uh, about how we think some of these rocks have formed. So um, this particular example is a meteorite called Sagami, which is a well-known meteorite from Mars. Um, we've known about it for a long time. People have been publishing on it since the 1970s. And the one thing that even if you read early papers from the 1970s, people tell you about Sagami is that there's a preferred alignment of crystals. Well, I hope you'll agree that from that image, it's not obvious where that preferred alignment is. Are they aligned uh, uh, top to bottom relative to the sample you can see there? Are they left to right? Or is it some way otherwise inclined that we can't see? And that's the problem. With optical methods, there is always a relative nature as to which way you're looking at the sample as to how you describe it. Whereas electron backscattered diffraction can really clearly define it for you because we can look at the crystallographic axes. So here is some EBSD data from that exact thin section that you see behind. And you can see three different plots here. So we're looking at the 100 axes, the 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1. So three different crystallographic axes that all inter, um, uh, intersect each other. And we do see some uh, alignment along this one, and we see some clustering here. So this is a whole data set. This is about 22,000 data points, but we actually want to reduce that and look at a single point per grain because we might get lots of different points on the same grain if the grain size is large enough. So if we reduce that down using one point per grain analysis, we've got about 1800 data points now. And those patterns are very, very clear. So I've put the, um, the crystal axes over here. So this is a mineral called orgite, which is a really common pyroxene mineral. It's a rock forming mineral we get in lots of volcanic environments. And you can see the 001, which is where we see this alignment on the right hand side, corresponds to the axis running through the crystal and then the 100 and 010 are intersecting the shorter axes so what we're saying is we're seeing some kind of an alignment where this long axis is the important one that we need to think about so what does that mean for these types of meteorites well we have this chemical variation so where we have these large crystals in a fine grain matrix do we see the same thing do all of the minerals align in the same way well, let's have a look. So we have this fine grained material around the outside. This is our orgite, our pyroxene that we talked about earlier. So here's the, here's the data again. We have an alignment on the long axes. But if we look at this larger crystal in here, this is a different mineral called olivine. Again, very, very common in um, geological samples, um, particularly where we have volcanic environments. And we can look at the same axes. Um, it's, a, it's an orthorhombic system rather than a monoclinic one, this particular variety, but we can use the same axes, 100, 010, and 001. And hopefully you can see that this is a very, very different pattern. It's very clearly different where we have an alignment and clustering 
in the Orgite. We don't see that in the Olivine, in the variety Forsterite at all. And this is what we would call a single crystal fabric. So we don't see any kind of preferred alignment in this phase, but we do see it in the other one. So again, that tells us that the environment in which this rock formed, in which the magma and the lava crystallized slowly to form the rock that we see today, the conditions didn't stay the same throughout the history. Something changed because these patterns show us that different conditions existed. And that can be true if we look at various different types of meteorites. So again, we just quickly go through um, another meteorite example, again, one from Mars. And you can see this one here has a much more regular structure. We don't see those really large crystals in amongst a fine grain matrix. Everything is relatively similar size, but the compositions are very much um, the same as what we saw before. So we have very iron and magnesium rich pinks and blues here. These are our pyroxene minerals. And then we have some aluminium and calcium um, rich feldspar minerals in between. And when we look at the variation here, depending on which scale you look at, this is a what we call a gabbroic um, meteorite. It's very, very coarse grained in relation to some of the finer grained examples before. You can actually see that these crystals are on a millimeter scale. And that's important because we see some chemical variations in these, um, in these minerals. They're not homogeneous. So they might have, for example, a much more magnesium rich core and a depleted magnesium rim, where actually we see that relationship changing between different phases. So that might be a very regular core to rim uh, variation, or there might be areas within a single crystal that are asymmetrically zoned. So we have some areas here where we have a magnesium rich patch and then it's much more iron rich around the outside, but it's a very different relationship that we see in other pyroxenes within the same sample. So again, that tells us chemically that it looks like the conditions of crystallization have changed. So how can the EBSD help us? Well, let's pick an area where we see some of that chemical variation and have a look. So in our band contrast image, in our EBSD data, we can see that we get uh, quite a lot of areas where we get really, really good signal, and then we get some areas where we get no signal. And that's because the feldspar in these samples is actually a glass now. It's become amorphous because it's a meteorite. It's been impacted, and that shock has caused um, um, the glass, the plagioclase, to become amorphous. And there's no crystalline structure to be determined. But the pyroxenes, those really, really common minerals, have uh, still exist, so we can see those um, recorded very well. So first of all, we look at the phases. So we have two different types of pyroxene here. We have orgite, which is represented in yellow. That's the same one I showed you on the previous plot where we had a preferred alignment. And then we have pigeonite, which is, a, uh, which is red, which is a calcium poor version of orgite. So they're very, very similar. It's actually a chemical variation in the amount of calcium enriched in that structure. And in the EBSD data, we look at an IPF figure. So this is along the x-axis. Um, you can see a very, very clear relationship. So a single grain is very much oriented in the same direction, but they're all different to each other. Interestingly, in this section that we haven't seen before, um, we see what we call twins, which are very common in geological samples, where you have a single crystal that's split along a crystallographic plane, and you get a different orientation slightly on each side of that crystal. So we've got lots of examples of twinning in here, which we hadn't seen before in this group of Martian meteorites. So this was quite a cool um, uh, discovery. However, if instead of looking at the x-axis, we change it and look at the y-axis, you can see that those twins are no longer visible. And that's because they're twins along a particular plane. So those ones were twins along the x-plane. And when we look in the y, we can no longer see those twins in these crystals, but other crystals might be exhibiting twinning. So we're starting to see something a little bit different. Again, if we change into the Z axis, again, you can see some of those twins appear and some disappear. But what's interesting is the large crystal that we have across the top here actually shows this mottled texture, no matter which axis um, you're looking at. So we could look at the Y axis here between the blue and the green. Um, the X axis is very, very subtle there in the red. It's not so obvious. But if we go into the Z, you can see all the shades of blue and green in here, which show that there's been some deformation. Something is trying to change the crystallographic orientation of these crystals, um, but it hasn't been able to go all the way so that we see different orientations entirely. So there have been some crystallographic changes in these crystals, which means something changed in the magma chamber or as this lava erupted and started to cool. 
So um, somebody had been looking at this meteorite, um, Andrea uh, Mido in her thesis was talking about um, the chemical variations within these samples. So we wanted to go in and have a look and see if we could explore them any further using the electron backscatter diffraction techniques. So on the right hand side, you have the X, Y and Z axis plots, and then also the phase map um, between the pigeonite in red and the audrey in yellow. Um, those holes you can see are holes from laser ablation points. So these uh, these have been analysed um, to try and determine their composition, and you can see those labelled down here in letters A, B, C, D, and E. So they are supposed to be there. Um, what was interesting about this is if we look at the EBSD data over a larger area, not just that particular crystal that was of interest in uh, Andrea's study, was that the kernel average uh, map here can show where you've got um, an order of some kind of change, so misorientation, and if we go into the orientation spread, so how much change you have relative within the grain, it actually is all pretty homogeneous, except for the larger crystals where we have cores. But interestingly, the single grain that Andrea was really curious about that had been um, zapped with a laser, the laser ablation point is very clear. You can actually see that by doing the laser ablation, we've caused some da damage to the natural crystalline structure. And it's very, very clearly indicated here. So as geologists, we need to be really careful that if we're going to do EBSD analysis on these things, we do it first before we start zapping things with lasers because we might be overprinting some of the natural crystalline structure and therefore making bad interpretations. But if we combine all those X, Y, and Z plots together, we can look at the Euler map, and uh, Euler is a type of mathematics, it's a very old type of mathematics that's, uh, that gets utilised in looking at these axes, and we can show that uh, each colour is a different orientation, we can see the twins very, very clearly, and what we can see here is that there isn't a preferred orientation. If we had a preferred orientation and all the crystals had flowed and they'd aligned all in the same direction, we'd expect a lot of very similar colours, but we don't have that here. So that would suggest that this rock yeah, is the result of crystal settling in a magma chamber rather than a flow on the surface because a flow gives you a direction and we would expect everything to align in a similar orientation. So does that correlate with the chemistry of these areas? Well, we think so. You can see um, we have some very pink uh, cores and blue rims. So that's a magnesium rich core and an iron rich rim. And that kind of zonation, chemical um, diffusion between the core and the rim of a crystal tends to happen whilst these things, um, whilst they crystallize and cool very slowly because it gives time for those changes to happen. And again, that's more indicative of something settling rather than uh, flowing on a landscape. So that can be um, extrapolated back up to the larger area. So this is where we were looking in that particular grain. You can see a couple of others were looked at for laser ablation as well. And uh, we were able to talk about that across the whole scale of the sample for Mars. So why is that important? Well, it's important for planetary science because sometimes we get large samples that we're able to look at and sometimes we get very small samples. All of them are very small, obviously, um, in comparison to planetary scales. But there are missions out there that are flying around at the moment going to recover samples directly from asteroids and bring them back here to Earth. So we had the Japanese space agency JAXA sent a mission out to this asteroid here, this rotating image is probably very slow on your screens, um, it's asteroid Itakawa, and Hayabusa went to Itakawa, it actually touched down on the surface of the asteroid, picked up some small particles and brought them back to Earth. And over here on the left-hand side, you can actually see one of these single particles that's been brought back. Not very many were brought back in the original Hayabusa mission, but they are available and we have them in the lab. And we're able to image them using the same techniques that I've described here. And the EBSD data could tell us a lot about how these, how these rocks, how these samples formed on an asteroid that something out there had visited. And that's really pertinent today because there are two other missions that have gone out to sample asteroids that are on their way back to Earth as we speak. There's Hayabusa 2, um, which was sent out by the Japanese Space Agency, which touched down at the end of last year um, on its target asteroid and is coming back. And there's also a NASA mission, um, OSIRIS-REx, which is going out to another asteroid, um, Bennu, and that one will bring back samples as well. So the solar system is a really big and very diverse place. Um, we can use the Earth as an analogue and see whether the patterns we see on Earth are replicated on other planets like Mars and whether they're any different with moons and asteroids. And EBSD allows us to explore some of those um, and answer some of those questions about how things are formed, um, which we can do using naturally delivered samples in meteorites until we're able to go out there and explore the solar system ourselves.
So with that, I'm going to stop talking and uh, see if you have any questions. So thank you very much.